Hey everyone, welcome back to another week here on the Foundry Church YouTube channel. We're so excited that you guys came to see what God is doing in and through his church. If you're looking to stay more connected with us throughout the week, the best way to do that is go to our Facebook page and like us. That way you can see our posts throughout the week as well as these YouTube videos. And speaking of that, if you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and do so. Now with that said, let's get into this week's message. Well, hey, Foundry Church, uh, we're just going to address something kind of awkward right now. You notice there might be some wet spots on my shirt. Um, it's just because my shirt got wrinkly and I had to spray iron it. It's not because I'm sweating in an air-conditioned building. Put your judgment away. All right, so as we get going today, we are going to talk about a subject. This is um, an out-of-series teaching. It's kind of a one-off. It's dealing with a scripture that I have chewed on for the last number of months, especially while my family was in Africa this last summer uh, doing some mission work. I really spent a lot of time in the first five verses of Psalm 139. Today we're going to talk about being known. We're going to talk about being known. Um, so I have to start off by shaming myself because what other way is there? Um, so in high school, back in the day um, when I was in high school, my buddies, Adam, and Jarrett, there were more than just Adam and Jarrett, but primarily the three of us really hung out a lot. Adam had a girlfriend, and Jarrett had a girlfriend. I did not. And um, I started to feel kind of dumb being around them as the fifth wheel all the time. So um, I'd go alone with them to the movies. <laughs> it was just weird. And you would think I would have got the social cues, but no, I didn't. So um, my buddy Adam had a pool, and there was an inflatable shark Barbara, who floated on the top of the pool day in, day out. She looked lonely. I felt lonely. So one day I grabbed her by her dorsal fin, and, um, and I, I just, I was like, this is my girlfriend. I'm tired of you guys talking smack. And I began, um, I wouldn't say it was an intense relationship. It was profoundly one-sided. But um, I stole Adam's pool float. I remember Mickey like, where's the shark? I'm like, She's with me for a while, Mickey. Um, but that was Adam's mom, and um, I stole the shark. And now, at this point, I could go to Adam's pool, to the beach, or to the movies and not feel dumb. I had a date, and if you think I didn't take Barbara with me, you are sorely mistaken. I remember Jarrett would be like, dude, E, put the, put the shark away. I'm like, nope, tired of being lonely. You know, I didn't buy her a ticket to the movies, but she got a seat. And um, we would, I mean, I literally, I had a baby great white right there. And it was a lot of fun, but it was one of those things where I was tired of being out of relationship, right? And uh, and it was funny. I actually called both Adam and Jarrett today. I'm like, I'm telling this story. And it was it was a lot of fun. But, um, but you look at that and you're like, oh, okay. You, there's just a, a want to be part of a group that is having relationships and you feel on the outside. I, I also love, like, Hallmark movies. Right? I wouldn't say I love them. I know people who love them. Bella and Erica love them, especially at Christmas time. Right? I know that there are people who pay for two months of cable every year to have the Hallmark Channel Christmas movies. We watch these, these highly produced, wonderful movies. Um, and they make us long for relationship, don't they? They make us long for these things. We know the storyline. Complicated girl from small town gets full ride to Princeton. Masters from Columbia ends up editor of the op-ed page at the New York Times and comes home because Aunt Mildred has gotten sick and she has to take care of the family cider mill. When longtime young boyfriend is now like the big guy in town, and they kind of butt heads, and you think, no, sparks are going to fly. They're going to fall in love. And the next thing you know, there's a fire roaring, a long gaze, and you're like, it's happening. And then the ex-girlfriend walks, and you're like, no, she's here. Oh, boo, right? And But you know, even though it looks like it's not going to happen, suddenly over a glass of cider with Kenny G playing in the background, they fall in love. And you sit there, and somebody just giggled deeply in the back. Of them. It's true. I love them. Um, it, it's how it goes. And we find ourselves wanting relationship. We find ourselves that, um, oh, man, it just makes you long for that kind of relationship. Today I want to talk to you about a real relationship, about a relationship that is deep and abiding and um, 
Though it's in no way a romantic relationship, it is a deep, loving relationship. It is a friendship and a kinship that goes deeper than we can imagine. It is the story that comes out of Scripture where the Lord Jesus Christ shows us what it's like to long for a friendship. Like it, I wouldn't say it's the hallmark kind of story, but it's this beautiful story of redemptive relationships and being known. So let me tell the backstory to it. Jesus is walking along, talking to his disciples, telling him that the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, must be betrayed, and once he's betrayed, he'll be put on trial, crucified, and die, right? And there's this whole kind of conversation of like, why does the Son of Man, why does Jesus, why does our rabbi have to go through this? And, um, and Jesus says to his disciples, even you will leave me. And there's one guy who's like always quick with a comeback. And he's like, I won't leave you, Jesus. I'm amazing. Remember me, Petros, the rock, you name me that, Jesus. I will never leave you. I will be faithful to you. Everybody else will probably go, but not me. And Jesus turns to him and he says, Peter, you can almost feel the, the, like, the other guys like, I can't believe he just threw us under the bus like that. And Peter being like, that's right. This is awesome. And he says, Peter, before the rooster crows three times, you will have denied me. And Peter looks aghast. He's like, no, never, Lord. Never would I betray you. Never would I do that to you. That is not possible. It is not in my character. And they move on. Jesus is arrested, and when he's arrested, Peter follows the soldiers and the gallery of people moving towards the Sanhedrin where Jesus will be put on trial. Standing out in the cool, dry Mediterranean air that night, Peter goes to warm himself by a fire, and a girl says, hey, you you sound like a Galilean. They have their own kind of uh, regional uh, kind of dialect, not dialects, but accents, right? I met an Irish guy yesterday. He's like, hello, I'm Dan. And I'm like, oh, Dan, that's awesome. You're Irish. And I was so happy about it. I, I was like, my wife would love to meet you. And he's like, oh, I'm like, it's a Bono thing. It's a whole U2 issue, right? But, um, but I was talking to him, and his, his accent immediately gave away that he was Irish, Peter's accent immediately gives away that he's a Galilean, and people start putting two or two and two together and, um, and helping connect, be like, yeah, you, you sound like a Galilean, and Jesus travels with Galileans. A lot of his disciples are from Galilee, and you look like one of them. Peter says, no, I don't know him. I don't know him. Yeah, I have a Galilean accent. But, you know, no, he's not mine. You know, a little Irish lilt, and like, whoa, he, he denies him. Next person says to him, and when he moves to a different fire, and the next person says, yeah, you, you were with Jesus, I think. I think I've seen you traveling with him. Um, yeah, you're one of his disciples. What's going on? He says, no, no, no. I don't know the man. I, I don't know Jesus. And you can see him pulling further and further away. Finally, a little girl says, no, no, I think they're right. I think you're one of them. I've seen you with Jesus. I've seen you teaching with him and walking with him. Peter swears at the child, swears at the individual and says, I do not know the man. At that moment, the rooster crows. And you're in a colonnade type facility. It's there's columns like in our in our main space here where um, there's columns and things, and Jesus is in this colonnade on trial at the Sanhedrin. And it says when the cock crows, Jesus made eye contact with Peter. And Peter imploded. He recognized that he had betrayed the the Son of Man. He had betrayed his best friend. He had done the very thing that he publicly declared he would never do. Peter had failed to love Jesus. Peter had failed to be a faithful friend. And so Peter runs off and weeps bitterly. Jesus is put on trial. He is flogged. He is crucified. He dies and he is buried. Peter, washed with grief, even hearing the story of the resurrection, goes back and he does what he knows to do best. He starts fishing. It says one night the guys go back and they start fishing. I mean, what are you going to do? Your rabbi has died. 
your best friend Jesus, whom you betrayed, has died. What are we going to do? So Peter goes back, and they're in a boat, and they're fishing. They fish all night, and they catch zero fish. This should echo for us from the beginning of Peter's life. They catch zero fish. Meanwhile, Jesus, makes the resurrected Lord, makes his way down to the beach, starts a fire, and begins cooking bread and fish for them to have breakfast. And he says, did you catch anything? They don't recognize that it's Jesus. And they said, no, we haven't caught anything, but thanks for asking, right? (sighs) Throw your nets on the other side of the boat to catch fish. I love that. This is the same story as what happened when he called him. So they throw their nets to the other side. They begin to haul in such a catch that it's swamping the boats. Peter recognizes that it's Jesus, and he dives in, and he comes running up the beach to meet Jesus. He runs up to the beach, and he sees the resurrected Lord. He sees the one who he's betrayed, and we pick up the story in John chapter 21 Verse 1, it says this, when they had finished eating breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these others? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus replied, then feed my lambs. A second time he asks, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you, Peter responds. A third time he says to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter replies, well, Peter's hurt. Peter has hurt feelings at this point. He has hurt feelings that Jesus asked him a third time, and he says, Lord, you know that I love you. You know all things. You know I love you. And Jesus replies a third time, feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted. When you were old, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands And someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death which Peter would die die and glorify God with. Then he said to him, follow me. Follow me. This is a fascinating exchange. Because Peter has this tight-knit relationship with Jesus Christ. He is so close. And his worst sin is now out in the open. He has betrayed Jesus. He's fully known. He's fully known by Jesus Christ for his flaws and his strengths. And yet Jesus restores him and says, follow me. Follow me. It connects well to Psalm 139. Psalm 139 is the psalm I, again, have been chewing on for quite a while. And it's important that we recognize that in this psalm, we are known just as Peter was known to Jesus. We are known to Jesus, our Heavenly Father, and the Holy Spirit just as Peter was known. We are fully known. God is not shocked at your brokenness or my brokenness. He is not shocked that we need redemption. That's why he sent Jesus so that all may come. He knows, get this, God knows that we are but dust. We are animated by his spirit and the breath of life in us, but we are but dust. He knows we have a limited capacity to see or even comprehend his plan. He gets it. God knows us in our limitations and our incredible giftedness. He knows us. Here's how Psalm 139 says it. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts why they are far from me. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand on me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me to know, too great for me to attain. I hear those words. From the psalmist, you have searched me, Lord. It's not a passing glance. God has searched Peter. God has searched us. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You know my thoughts when they're far away. You know them. You discern my going out, my lying down when I, oh, when I, whatever I do. You're familiar with all my ways. Before words on my tongue, you know it. You know it. You know it completely. You hem me in. You protect me. You, you kind of keep me boxed in behind and before. You protect me like a sheep in a pen, and you lay your hand on me. 
I want the redundancy of you hearing that a couple of times. What a beautiful thing. I want it to rest in your ears. I mean, look at the beautiful language that goes on in this. Let's look at this section of Scripture between the life of Peter and Jesus, between their intersection of relationships. Jesus knew. I want you to understand this. Jesus knew Peter, and he knew him Like he knows before a word is on our tongue, he knows it completely. Jesus knew Peter, but he knew him man to man. I don't know about this, but if you have any good close friendships or relationships, you can tell after a little while when like when they're gonna move in their chair. Like, well, it's been eight minutes, they're uncomfortable, and they're like, oh. And you're like, oh, there it is, right? Anybody have friendships like that? Where you just know them. You know the sound, like if you're married, you know the sound. Maybe your, your uh, husband or wife makes when they sleep, which I would like to apologize for the sound I make when I'm like, you know. Like you know the sound of someone when you're close to them of them falling asleep. Peter and Jesus walked daily together for three years. They slept in the same places. Jesus knew Peter's table manners. He's like, oh, there's Peter wolfing down the fish. You know, oh, you know Peter. Stop it. You know, we're, we're with people here, you know. He knew Peter. He fully knew him man to man. They were friends. They were tight. They get each other. So I called my buddy Jarrett Parr from uh, high school today. I just felt like I had to call Adam and Jarrett and be like, by the way, I'm telling the story about Barbara the shark. And when Jarrett answers the phone, he goes, these are his exact words. Oh, God, e, what's up? I'm like, dude, we haven't talked in like a year. He's like, you're not in jail. <laughs> I'm like, dude, I'm a pastor. He's like, oh, so everything's good. I'm like, are you being serious? He's like, yeah, I just, I just thought, why? I'm like, I'm calling to tell you I'm telling the shark story. He falls apart, but he knew me. He knows I belong in jail. <laughs> based on that, based on my good friend being like, his first words like, oh, what's up, E? That, that's like, it's telling. He knows me man to man. But in the same way, Jesus knew Peter, God to man. Jesus knew Peter at a divine level as well with a spiritual intuition and understanding. Jesus was God and Jesus knew the words of the psalmist and it's why I believe in John 2 24 it says this that Jesus did not entrust himself to people to them so the crowds or even his disciples because he knew what was in the heart of man. He knew what was so broken in them. He knew how fickle they were. He knew that Jesus, Jesus knew that Peter would betray him. He knew the words he would use before they ever rolled off Peter's tongue. He understood Peter's betrayal was coming, yet he loved him. Jesus knew. Jesus knew that this was coming, yet he loved him. He still loved him. Jesus still loved Peter, and he knew full well the brokenness that Peter would inflict on him. And I love that. Jesus loved Peter. And it, his love for Peter was real. It was complete. And it was unconditional. May it never be said of our Lord and Savior that his love is anything less than real, complete, and unconditional. It is the kind of love that not fuels us into our purpose, that gives us safety and peace in the storms of this life, knowing that we are really loved by a God who loves us real, complete, and unconditionally. Peter knew that. Jesus loved Peter unconditionally. But because he loves him, sometimes I'll see people um, who, uh, they don't want to hurt somebody's feelings, so they don't confront sin issues. And they're like, well, I don't want to hurt their feelings. Um, A friend of mine, Jacob, said it this way, I don't ever want to send someone to hell well fed, which means this, I don't want you to be so comfortable in your sin that I'm not willing to destroy our relationship to speak truth. Now, you hope you don't have to do that, but the reality of this is that um, Jesus loved Peter completely, so he was willing to speak hard words into his life. He was willing to do the thing that was painful, so Jesus calls Peter higher. And this is a critical facet of our faith and of this church. And I'm going to challenge you, Foundry Church. We are in a phase where you have to plug in or choose not to. 
Because we are a church and we are moving forward in what God called us to do. And we see in Peter's life, he's, God, Jesus isn't afraid to speak and call higher. And he's not afraid today. Just as fearless as he was 2,000 years ago, he remains the same today. Today I want to talk to you about two kinds of love. Two kinds of love that are present. Now there's more than that um, by the Greek definition, but there's two kinds of love present in the text of Jesus restoring Peter. When Jesus restores Peter, there's two kinds of love being expressed. One is agape love. Agape is real, complete, unconditional love. It's a, it's a divine, it's, it's just real, complete, and unconditional love. It's a Greek word that means love from God, like love, the love of God. That it's so perfect it can't be humanly introduced. And then there's another kind of love. We understand this. The city of Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love, phylos, okay, agape phylos. Phylos, brother, brotherly love, okay? So we have these two kind of loves. And when we see this, we understand that Peter is called by God, by Jesus Christ, and he says, do you agape me? Do you love me real, complete, and unconditionally? And Peter says, I love you like a brother. That's the difference. Matt and I were talking about this, Matt and Erica and I, when we were working on this sermon, and Matt was kind of pointing this out. I'm like, that is such a cool truth. He was responding in the Greek. He was saying, do you love me agape? Do you have this agape love? And Peter's like, I love you like a brother. He said, I agape you. And Peter said, I philo, philos. I love you like a brother. And so Jesus asks him again, Because Jesus knows that Peter is capable of friendship, brotherly love, and to that depth. And Jesus receives it. He doesn't say, oh, that's the lamest thing. You know, it's like when you tell, if you're dating somebody, like, I love you, and they're like, "Mm mm-hmm, I like you. Oh, that's not what you want to hear, right? But that's kind of what happened. And Jesus still receives what Peter is able to give him. But he called him to transformation, to learn to love Jesus fully, completely, and unconditionally. Jesus asks him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you agape? Do you love me in a real, complete, and unconditional way? And Peter almost steps back. He's like, I do. I love you like a brother. And there, it's like when you ask your kids, hey, you know, if you left chores, hey, did you pull the weeds? Oh, yeah, there's weeds. That's not what I ask. Did, did you pull them? They're, they're everywhere. <laughs> He's not answering the question. So Jesus goes back to it a third time. And in Peter's answer, I feel like there's a desperation. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? more than the rest of these. Peter, with hurt feelings, and I think maybe exhausted because he knows his own limitations and he's not about to make a huge proclamation and fall short again, says, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Philos, I love you like a brother. And he's kind of like, that's the best I can do. But Jesus doesn't let him stay there. Jesus calls him I think the emphasis on this is Jesus says, um, and in the message in Thessalonians, there's a scripture that says, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Then come to me, get away with me. I will teach you to walk freely and lightly. Watch how I do it. Walk with me, work with me. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. That's what Jesus does to Peter here. He says to him, okay, I I receive your brotherly love. I'm gonna show you how to love like God does. I'm gonna teach you how to love. How wonderful is it for Peter to be known? He's confessing, I can only love you to the depth of who I am. And Jesus says, I will transform you to love me the way I love you. I will give you that capacity. We're accepted as we are. We are loved as we are, but we are called into a life of transformation. If you're here to stay the same, you're in the wrong place because we believe this. We believe this. But it leaves us wondering, like, okay, um, this is a perfect song. I'm going to have uh, I'm going to have him play it because it's the perfect song for uh for this. It's uh, a band I used to roller skate to. If you know the band when you hear the song, just raise your hand with me. Check this out.
this is, um, this is where I think we ask the question, can anybody find me? Somebody love, somebody who will love. We can't have this kind of relationship. We may think, well, Peter lived and it was different 2,000 years ago, but that doesn't separate, time doesn't separate you from the love of God. Just as the psalmist made his commitment in the words of Psalm 139, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know where I sit. You know when I stand. You perceive my thoughts from afar before a word is on my tongue. You know it completely. When we see those words, we know this, that the psalmist is saying, not only has he searched you, there is nowhere you can go that will separate you from God. Psalm 139 says it this way. Where can I go? This is verse uh, 7 through 12. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, there you are also. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, I settle on the far side of the sea. Even there, your hand will guide me. Put your hand on me. I love that. Your right hand will hold me fast. I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light will become night around me. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. For the night will shine like day, for darkness is as light to you. Oh, we don't have to run and hide from God. There is nowhere we can get away from what we've done to hurt him, but the great news is on the other side, there is nowhere we can go where we are separated from the love of God. We find in Romans chapter eight, a book written by the Apostle Paul after Christ had lived, crucified, was crucified, died, and was raised again and ascended to heaven. We find these words echoing the words of Psalm 139 when the Apostle Paul says it this way. I'll go to this. Jesus Christ who died And more than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and also interceding for us. What will separate, or who shall shall separate us from the love of God in Christ? Shall trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword? As it is written, Paul says, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, angels or demons, neither the present nor the future, or any other powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That complete love is given to you and me just as it was given to Peter. We are completely loved. And so here's the good news. If you want to find somebody to love, the first thing you need to know is that you are loved as you are dearly and profoundly loved in a real, complete, and unconditional way by your Savior, Jesus Christ, by your Heavenly Father, and by the Holy Spirit. You are loved by the triune God. It is proved in the life of Jesus Christ. And here's the reality. First, we have to know that we are loved. We are loved by God. He, here it is, real love really knows us. The love of God compels us to understand he knows us. All those dark things you keep in the corner of your heart and soul and mind, he knows, yet he loves you. He knows and loves. He knew you before He knows before you sin. He knows when the words are on the tip of your tongue. He knows right before you fail, lie, forget. He knows this. Just like Peter, you are but dust. You are finite. You are not big enough, intelligent enough, or able to comprehend or understand his plan. But he really knows us, yet he loves us. Don't ever forget that the love of God is not broken by your lack of capacity to understand it and fully receive it. You are loved. But the joy in knowing that real love still loves us is this. We are loved completely. 
So when you come here, and I want you to hear this, come as you are and meet God on his terms, not ours. And his terms are this, I love you. I've proven it and I will continue to prove it in, my bo- in the body of Christ, through the life of Christ, and currently lived out through the church. He will prove his love for you completely and unconditionally. And this is my hallmark moment. He sees a future with you. Love sees a future. I love that. He sees a future. You know that moment in the Hallmark movies when all of a sudden the, the, you know, the roughneck contractor who has gigantic forearms and it's just the chiseled jawlines. Where do they find these men? I'm so, I'm a little bitter. It's a side note, but I'm like, you, you are a handsome man. Um, and, and they're like so hard-hearted and like, you know, but all of a sudden you, they're like talking to their, you know, to the girl who came home for a sick aunt. They're like talking to the sick aunt and it's like, I don't know, I can just see a future with her. Right? And you're like, oh, I can too. Marry her, Dirk. You know? You feel that way. When someone says, I can see a future with you, this is the thing. He loves you completely, unconditionally. And he sees a future with you for his plans and his purposes, for you to be everything you were ever made to be. He sees a future with you. But real love calls us higher. Make no mistake that you can't stay static in this. this. Real love doesn't let us just stay broken. Real love repairs our lives. God repairs and transforms our lives. It accepts where we are are at, but it doesn't accept that we're going to stay there. It's okay not to be okay. It's just not okay to stay there. I think Matt Chandler said it that way, and I think that's a great way to say it. It is okay not to be okay. But it's not okay to stay there. It's okay if you only understand, hey, I love you, Jesus, like a brother. But Jesus says, one day I want you to know how to love me like I love you. To love me the way I love you because I will tell you this. The Apostle Peter shows us how deep the transforming work of God can go in our life. Under the Emperor Nero, about 65 AD, the Apostle Peter was put to death by crucifixion on a hill outside of Rome. We now call it Vatican City. Whole different thing there, but it's so awesome. Okay, anyways, Peter was crucified right there, but he would not die a death reflecting Jesus like he wouldn't be crucified as Jesus was. He said, no, I don't deserve that death. So what did he say? Take the cross and flip it. Crucify me upside down. I am not worthy to die a death of my own Lord. He loved Jesus so much that the worst death possible he made worse. By saying, I'm not worthy. I love him too much to even pretend that my death is anything in a shadow of resemblance to his. Flip me upside down. And the Romans agreed. And they did this. Real love calls us higher. Real love is something we learn by walking with Jesus. It's why we say in devotion, like get into devotions. Walk with him daily. Walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Read the devotions. Read the scriptures. Be in the word of God. Be transformed. Because... There's somebody to love in this world, and you've got to do it. You have to love people the way Jesus taught Peter to love. When Peter was put to death, he was put to death leading the church in Rome. He loved that church. He gave his life for them, serving them as the bishop of their church. I love what Peter did. He was put to death there because of his faithful service to the people of God. He served and he loved. One way Peter got to know how Jesus loved is he served people unconditionally and eventually learned to love completely in a real way and unconditionally. When Jesus says, feed my lambs, we can say to Peter, check, he did it. When Jesus says, take care of my sheep, check, he did it. When, we're, when we look and we see that final question and Jesus says, feed my lambs, we can look at Peter and say he did it. The question is, will you? Will you and I love the way Jesus taught? Will we serve people who don't deserve our time, treasure, and talent? It's maybe a rough way to say it, but it's the truth. Loving others in service teaches us to love unconditionally. Loving others and serving teaches us unconditional love. Jesus gave the formula to get to agape, Right? Jesus gave us the formula. He said, Peter, do you love me? Do you agape me? Lord, you know I love you like a brother. Then feed my sheep and you'll learn what agape is. That's the implied narrative here. And when we look at this, we have to realize the calling to us is quite simple. 
We will learn how to love Jesus wholeheartedly, unconditionally, and completely when we serve those whom he's calling to himself. My challenge to you, church, is don't be complacent in the call to learn to love through the service of people Christ died to save. Pray with me. God, thank you for this word. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can sit in the refrain of Psalm 139 and hear it for ourselves, that you have searched us, O Lord, and you know us. You have searched us and you know us. But because you love us, you hem us in behind and before, and then you put your hand on us. Lord, may your hand rest heavy on your church as we attend to your word and the call to transformation. We love you, Lord, and we ask that you would take now this word and weave it into our life that we would serve those who you died to save. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, we really hope that you got something out of this week's message. And if you want to get prepared for next week's, what you can do is you can click the link below in the description and that'll take you to our devotions page. We participate in devotions every week because that's part of our weekly rhythm here at the Foundry is being in God's word. Again, thanks for joining us and we hope to see you again next week.